Dear family and friends in Christ, may you know the rich grace, mercy, and peace of our Savior Jesus Christ, now and forevermore. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending forth your Son, Christ Jesus, who has been transfigured before us, who has changed, who has shown us the bright light of salvation. We pray that each and every day we would know this glory and know the promise that you are always with us. Help us to trust in you and trust in the amazing things that you continually do in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would bless our time together this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Catch. Some of you, if you are NFL fans, in particular if you're 49ers fans, you know exactly what I'm referring to when I say the catch. For those of you who are neither 49er fans or NFL fans, the catch is the 1982 NFC championship catch that won the game between Joe Montana and Dwight Clark. Some of you maybe remember seeing this game, but Joe Montana was on the run. He was nearly out of bounds, and he blinded by two guys, two uh, outside linebackers who were much taller than he was. He lobs the ball into the air. Dwight Clark, in seemingly inhuman, superhuman way, jumps in the air, grabs the ball, lands in the end zone, and that is the game-winning touchdown. Amazing. It's one that is still told. It is memorable throughout the NFL. Dwight Clark's catch. It is still remembered, and for those of you who are Dallas fans, then you will probably also remember that catch because that was the loss that Dallas was dealt uh, to stop their continued, from the 70s on, their success. Amazing. But perhaps football, perhaps sporting events are not so amazing to you, and that's okay. But you probably have several amazing things that have happened in your life. Things that you can call back, and even when everyone else has forgotten it, you remember amazing things that just stay in your memory and you hold on to. Some of those amazing things, they're things that, well, over time, they've become more amazing. Some of you maybe remember the, that fish you caught, 17 inches long. Well, maybe at the time it was, but it was 22 inches, and it nearly pulled you out of the boat. Maybe you also remember a time when you walked uphill both ways in the snow five miles to school in the Imperial Valley. <laughs> Maybe you remember the summer of 95, the hottest recorded summer here in the valley. You could fry an egg on the pavement, not, not only the egg though, but bacon and hash browns with it. Amazing things stick with us. And even more amazing are those things that happen to us. Things that we can hold on to. Things that we can remember. Those amazing events of our lives. They stay with us for a long time. They help to bring flavor to our lives. Help us to remember some of the joys, excitements. Well, today we have a life that is fairly amazing to look at. The life of Elijah. Except he doesn't have just like one or two amazing events. But you look at Elijah as he's recorded in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And it is amazing his life. Just today, in our reading from 2 Kings chapter 2, what did it say? A miraculous thing happened. He took his cloak off. He and Elisha needed to cross the Jordan River. He took his cloak off. He hit the water. They walked right across on dry ground. Amazing. But it wasn't just that, was it? If you remember back to 1 Kings chapter 17, you know that Elijah was present during a drought that hit the whole land of Israel. And if you remember, if you are familiar with droughts, you know that the poor, well, they have a hard time getting food. Everybody has a hard time getting food, but in particular, the poor. Well, he goes to this widow of Zarephath. As a widow, we know that she was part of the poor. And he asks her to make him some lunch. And she looks, and all she has left is just enough for one more meal. Her oil, her flour are just about out. She was ready to make a meal and die, as the scriptures tell us. But she fixes this meal for Elijah. And miraculously, throughout the drought, for three years, that flour and oil jar, they keep filling back up. They keep filling back up. They keep filling back up so that she never goes hungry and her son with her never goes hungry. Amazing. Then, Elijah, with the same widow at Zarephath, well, she had that son I told you about. He died. He got sick and died very quickly. That widow, she blamed Elijah. She said, Elijah, you have cursed my family. Elijah, he turned to the Lord and he prayed three times. He stretched out hands on the boy three times and prayed. After the third time, that boy was raised from the grave. Amazing. 
And it doesn't just stop there, does it? We keep reading through 1 Kings, and we see that Elijah, he has this showdown with these 450 Baal prophets. He calls them up to the mountain, and he, and, and he lines up side by side. Elijah on the one side, defending the true God. 450 prophets of Baal on the other side, defending Baal as the true God. Elijah makes a little agreement with them. And he says that, you call on your God. Let him rain down fire from heaven and, to eat and burn your sacrifice. He says, and I will call down my God and ask that he will rain down fire. So all day long, these prophets from Baal, 450 of them, they keep praying and keep praying. They even start, as Scripture tells us, they start cutting themselves, trying to appease the God, their God until their blood flows. But nothing, not even so much as a spark. It gets to be Elijah's turn. Elijah, he, he, he tells them, you know what, I set up my altar, I put up my sacrifice, but go ahead and put some water on top of it. And he says three times, pour water over my sacrifice. Pour it over the sacrifice until it was so saturated with water that it filled the entire trench around his sacrifice. The reason he did this was he didn't want anybody to say that what was about to happen wasn't amazing. But he calls down fire from heaven. And the Lord, with such an intense response, sends fire that eats up the entire sacrifice, the entire altar, and all the water in the ground right there. Amazing, right? And amazing too. Because then, at the end of Elijah's life, a faithful life to the Lord, in an amazing way, the Lord calls him home, right? Ama Here, he's with Elisha, and the Lord says, and, and as Elisha, as he's pr getting ready to pass on his mantle, the Lord says, come on home, Elijah. And he sends the chariots of fire. And he goes, and in only one other person in the Old Testament goes to be with the Lord without dying. Amazing. Now you look at a life like Elijah's, and here we are, 3,000 years later, still talking about his life. Amazing to talk about the things that happened to him, to talk about the way the Lord moved and worked in his life. You would think that we have nothing in comparison to him. How about you, 3,000 years from now? Do you think that people are still going to be talking about the amazing things that you did? For many of us, we're used to our routine lives, our uneventful lives. We're used to our lives that maybe they involve getting up late in the morning, having a cup of coffee, uh, clicking on Price is Right. Uh, maybe it's getting kids off to, the, off to school. Maybe it's getting to the doctor or getting to work. Our lives compared to Elijah's, well, they seem somewhat less than amazing. Maybe even as we look at Elijah's life, we almost would say our lives seem uneventful, even mundane. 3,000 years later, we talk about this amazing man, this amazing man of faith. Hmm. Seems like we have nothing in common with him. Unless you look past, past all the miracles, past all the amazing things that happened in Elijah's life, Unless you stop for a minute and you look beyond what God was doing and you see, then you see a man. And you see a man who is lonely and you see a man who is scared. A man who lived much of his life in fear for it that he might lose his life. Now this is a man we can relate to, isn't it? Unfortunately, this is a man we can, we can reflect on and we can think about because we know what loneliness means. We know the fears that plague our lives. Elijah Remember, he had that great showdown with the prophets, that amazing showdown where God ate up the entire altar with fire. Well, right after that, he didn't throw a victory celebration. Well, he did put to death all the false prophets, but then Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, came after him. And he went in the desert, and he was so down. He was felt so alone that he cried out to God, and he said, God, am I the only one left? Am I the only one left? Let me just die here in the desert. Sadly, sadly, we can relate to a man like that. A man who had seen the great things God had done, the amazing things God had done, and who still struggled in times of when he was down in fear and loneliness. Some of us know what it means to be lonely. We know what it means to be by ourselves. All of us want to have some kind of companionship, but not all of us feel it all the time, experience it. I've often said, and some of you have heard me say, that even though we live in a culture that's more connected than any in history, we are a disconnected people. And what I mean by that is, just think about your children and, the genera and my generation. 
We have, we have known the world news and the national news. We have known things that are happening on the other side of the world since the time we were born. We have known uh, the, the internet for almost from the time we were born. We get most of our information at a moment's notice. We know what long distance is, but we know free long distance. We don't know what party lines are. We're more connected. We have, well, we have cell phones and social media. And yet, it seems like people don't know how to communicate. It seems like even with all these connections, people are so disconnected. I like to people watch. I like to, to see what, uh, the way people behave together. And, and more than once, I've been at a restaurant, and maybe some of you have as well. And you see this table of people, and they have every single one of them has a cell phone in their hand. And not one of them is looking or talking to the other person. <laughs> they're surrounded by people, and yet they're disconnected. We live in a world that is full of disconnections, full of loneliness. We live in a world where we can truly relate to the aloneness that, well, that Elijah felt. And it wasn't just a lot of him feeling lonely, was it? He had fears, too. Fears that struck his heart. Fears that brought him to his knees. We can relate to that. Some of us blame the television and say, well, it's what we see on the news. But truly, we know that those fears, they stem from another place. They stem from our hearts. We have these fears as we look at all that is happening around us and we wonder, what will happen to the next generation? What could happen? What good could happen? We worry and we fear our broken relationships, whether we'll ever get back together with, our, with those who we are no longer speaking to. We fear and we worry about the things that are out of our control. Maybe even at times like Elijah, we even fear for our lives, but most of us not so much. But we do know fear. Elijah, maybe he's not so different from us after all. You know, maybe he's not so amazing. Think about that for just a second. It was not Elijah who was amazing, but it was what God was doing through Elijah that was amazing. It was not that Elijah was extra special. It was that God made him special. Now let's fast forward 900 years. 900 years from the time of Elijah. And we come to a mount where Peter, James, and John are up there. And again, Elijah, he makes the scene. He's up there with Moses and with Jesus. But the focus isn't on Elijah, is it? The, the focus isn't on what Elijah's doing this time. It's on Jesus, as it should be. And when everyone else disappears, who is still there? Jesus the beloved Son of God in whom we are to listen. Jesus is still there. And this is something that we should know about Elijah. Elijah and his whole ministry, he never wanted the focus to be on him. He didn't want it to be all about what he said or the amazing things he did, but he wanted to point to the Lord. He wanted his ministry to point to what God was doing. Not to his loneliness, not to his brokenness, but point to a God who can heal the loneliness and the brokenness of our lives. To point to a God who can move in our lives even when nothing else can. Elijah, he was up on that Mount of Transfiguration in an uneventful way, in a way that's unamazing. He gives us an example. He stands next to the Lord Jesus and he talks to him. He didn't do any miracles on that Mount. He didn't do anything special. But next to the bright light of Christ, he turns to the Lord, encouraging us to do the same, to turn to our Lord, to look to our Lord, to look to the face of our Savior, to see that we are never alone because he was alone for us. See, just as we come down this mountain, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, just as after we come down this mountain begins the Holy Week trek, it begins the 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 trek that ends with Jesus on the cross. And Jesus, he starts out with the disciples, but they abandon him. They fall asleep in the garden. When he's arrested, they run away. Jesus is alone. Jesus is truly alone on the cross in a way that we will never experience because not only did all his friends and family abandon him, but even the Father in heaven did. But he faced that alone, aloneness on the cross for us so that we would never be alone 
And then in an even more amazing way, in a more amazing way, he came through all those, uh, through that time of loneliness, that time of death on through the cross. And he came to bring us the glory and hope of salvation. In a light that shone brighter than the, br- the brightness of transfiguration, he showed the glory of salvation, the hope and promise of the resurrection. That throughout this life, that we know our Lord is with us. That even when we die, our Lord is with us. That as we, uh, as we talked about last week, that nothing will separate us from our Lord Jesus. Jesus is always with us. And like, like Elijah, we can stand next to him and he will listen to us as we are to listen to him. We can come to him with every prayer and petition, even the prayers of our uneventful and mundane lives, and, and he wants to hear them because they're not mundane to him. He wants to hear them. He wants a relationship with each one of us, one that we can talk to him and know that he is listening, one to know and to li- not only listen to, to, for him to listen to us, but for us to listen to him for him to speak back to us, giving us hope and promise that one day we shall be with him forever. Elijah, he gives us a great example, doesn't he? It's not what he did that was miraculous, but what it was the faith that he had. It's the faith that he had in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, looking forward to his Messiah, looking forward to the promised salvation. It was the faith that he had, knowing that one day he would be with the Lord forever. And while we may not join the Lord in a whirlwind and a, and a chariot of fire, we do know we'll be with our Lord forever in the promised salvation. Amen. Now that is a truly amazing thing. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for blessing us with the example of Elijah, with his trust in you, his hope, knowing that you are salvation. Lord, we pray that in all of the days of our lives, we know that you are with us. We pray that as we begin this time of going through the Lenten season, that you would walk with us, guiding us and directing us. Help us each day of our lives to know that you are with us. Forgive us for those times when we do not recognize your presence, for those times when we turn our back on you. Help us to know always that nothing in this creation will separate us from you, but that you will always seek after us, that you will always be with us. Lord, lead us that one day, We will be with you forever in heaven. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.